Good morning, good morning. Uh, welcome to the service this morning. It is the last Sunday of the liturgical year, believe it or not. We call it the Reign of Christ or Christ the King Sunday. It's typically one of these festivals that we might dress up in white, uh, pair them in swift. And so it's just, again, another strange thing to be thinking through that uh, in our current circumstance. But I hope that this service finds you doing well in your bubble. And I know that we're all imagining what's going to be happening in the coming week with the announcements and when we'll be moving to the red zone. Session met this past week, and there'll be some more information coming to you next week as we hear from the central office in Wellington to get their take on things and make sure that our policies and our procedures and what we're planning to do aligns with the best advice. So again, we come together virtually and we're thankful for this technology to be able to worship together, to be able to join together in heart and mind. And so let's worship God together this morning. taken from 2 Samuel chapter 23 verses 1 to 7. Now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favourite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are all like fawns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. The second reading this morning is taken from John chapter 18, 
verses 33 to 38. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? God is still speaking and we are still listening. A few years ago, we decided to institute um, a policy in our house that on your birthday, you could basically run things. Uh, when it was your birthday, you could decide what the family ate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if there was something that you wanted to do on that day, the typical policy was that everybody had to say yes. Well, I won't name a particular child, but there was one year where that was taken a little bit too seriously, that amount of power, and we had to discontinue the king for a day policy, unfortunately. It was good while it lasted but it didn't last forever. And one of the reasons it didn't last is because we quickly realized that um, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And um, so now we basically say, okay, when it's your birthday, you get to decide what dinner is, but that's about it. And the rest of us can, can have a say in everything else. It's one of the interesting things as we come to this last Sunday of liturgical year, we talk about Christ the King or the reign of Christ. Uh, it was a day that was inserted into the liturgical calendar by the Roman Catholic Church in 1925 after the First World War. It, uh, the Pope at the time, Pope Pius, was um, interested in the church reflecting liturgically on the fact that while there may be absolute monarchs around in Europe, that Christ still demanded some allegiance from Christians over and above all of the nations of the world and above all of our ethnic and our national identities. And so it was a good thing, and it is a good thing. And over the years, it's become a day where we reflect on power and what power is and how we Christians should respond to it. Interestingly enough, um, power is a bit of a contested thing in Christianity, in liberal democracies in particular. Most of us are suspicious about power. We're not sure how we feel about it. We certainly don't want absolute power and we don't necessarily trust anybody who can wield power absolutely. It's become a proclivity of those of us who live in liberal democracies to critique people in power and certainly in our circumstances there's been no lack of that with these lockdowns. As you can see people have become um, very tired of being locked down and being restricted and so there's people who are rightfully so tired and fatigued from compliance and people taking to the streets and critiquing um, the power that's being exerted over all of us. Of course, some of these critiques are valid. They stem from very real concerns and very real psychological feelings. Perhaps our ability to comply is down to the bottom of our bucket and we don't know where more is going to come from. And even the hope of transitioning into a red light um, level is important as well. That helps boost our ability to stick with it. But some of these critiques are obviously erroneous and they're inelegant and dare I say dangerous. So comparing the prime minister to Hitler, not really a good thing. Uh, comparing our lockdown to a concentration camp, not really a good thing. And it's not just here, it's all over the world in Western liberal democracies where these critiques are being made, these sloppy criticisms. And I think it's the 
the duty of every Christian to push back on these, but also to say that, yes, we know that we need to live in a society. We need to order ourselves around certain competencies and certain exertions of power, and we need to maintain our ability to critique them, to prote protest against them, to ensure that those powers are exerted um, dutifully and uh, liberally and equally, uh, and that they don't overtake the rights of individuals or groups to exert their natural God-given rights. Um, but we also need to recognize the circumstances that we're in. And the circumstances that we're in are novel. They're something we've never been in before. And so even the government, and governments all over the world, quite frankly, their abilities, um, what they're doing, what they're trying to do and alleviate is really like building a plane while it's flying. It's um, we're, we're in novel territory. Everything is new. And so there's going to be some mistakes and history will judge those. But we have to think about where um, and what the circumstances, what's the guiding principles behind the exertion of power. And I think that's what Christ would have us do. If we look at his interactions with Pilate and we see them here in the 18th chapter of John, it's probably one of the most important passages in the entire New Testament. Pilate is the most powerful person in the Bible, other than Pharaoh, perhaps. Um, Jesus comes face to face, not with Caesar, but with Caesar's ambassador, Caesar's representative. And it's Pilate who's most interested in whether Jesus is a king, in whether Jesus has a kingdom and whether his kingdom has power, real power. And by that, he means whether it has soldiers and whether it has arms. And he wants to know if Jesus is king of the Jews. And he wants to know this because any other king is a threat to the real king, the real emperor back in Rome. But Jesus in classic, classic Jesus mode resists answering these questions. He just resists answering. Every time he's asked whether he is the king of the Jews, he resists. He asks Jesus, he asks Pilate questions, um, you know, um, do you ask this for your own or did others tell you about me? You know, he wants to know, is this your question? Are you inquiring or are you asking on behalf of somebody? Are you trying to catch, catch, catch me in a legal question or do you really want to know? Another of the things that I find really interesting is the way that Jesus says this classic line, my kingdom is not from this world. If it were so, then my followers would be taking up arms to free me. Jesus is here indicating the type, the, the tenure, the, the, the quality of his movement, of the kingdom of God. It is not like the kingdoms of the world. John, of course, uses the word world to indicate everything that's wrong with creation, everything that's wrong with power, everything that's wrong and sinful about the way the world has gone wrong and not the way that God intended it to be. And so Jesus uses um, this um, sense of saying that his kingdom is not from this world. Now, you might have grown up hearing that passage and that phrase in particular translated differently. My kingdom is not of this world. And it's a real tricky translation, whether it's of or from. And in many cases, most pastors and most uh, interpreters, when they hear my kingdom is not of this world, they think that Jesus is simply trying to say that his kingdom is spiritual only, that it's far away, that it's from heaven, it's in heaven, and it's different qualitatively from the world and from the, um, the ways we experience the world as humans. And of course, that's a dangerous way to interpret it as well, because it gives this sense that we're somehow citizens or participants in otherworldliness, and that we don't have to be concerned with the world we live in, that things like climate change or bad governance or uh, fascism or um, power grabs by autocrats, that these aren't things that should concern us that we shouldn't be prayerful about them, that uh, we should just leave them to God and that we shouldn't take up our placards and protests in the streets when it's appropriate. And of course, when Jesus says, and if Jesus is saying, and I think he is, my kingdom is not from this world, he's saying that my kingdom does not draw its principles my, from this, this order, this regime, the way that the world is ordered around power and the weak um, and the power of violence to secure the power of those who are in charge. My kingdom is different. In fact, the second time that Pilate asks him, so are you, so you are a king then, right? Uh, Jesus again resists that claim. Um, and he simply says that he's come to testify to the truth. That's what he's come to do. 
Um, he's not come to take up arms. He's not come to be elected president He's or prime minister for that matter. He's simply come to testify to what is true. And those who listen to the truth, who hear it, belong to his kingdom. Uh, many interpreters, as this has gone on in history, have become uncomfortable with um, the, the, the way that Jesus has been cast as a king. Of course, king has a lot of connotations to it. Monarchs, absolute monarchs, absolute power um, have a lot of um, real reasons why people might push back against that. Not only because there haven't been many very good kings in history who haven't used violence to secure what they found to be given to them by God, um, but also because the word king is a masculine denoter and it's paternalistic uh, in some senses at its core. And so many interpreters, particularly feminist interpreters, have made the move, and one I particularly am quite fond of, to say that Jesus doesn't have a kingdom as much as he has a kindom, kin, for kindred, for family, for extended family. And I think that that's really interesting and powerful for where we are now, that more and more this pandemic is requiring us to think of ourselves not as just a nation and not as just a liberal democracy, and not just as um, New Zealanders or global citizens, um, but as kin, as people who are connected to one another, whose actions or inactions affect one another. Um, we're having conversations around public health, not just personal health. And so it demands that we see ourselves as interdependent, as belonging to one another, as um, needing one another. And so this is quite important when it comes to how we think about power. Uh, while we might be allergic to certain ways of, um, of seeing power, and while we as Christians, and some Christians would say we shouldn't even vote, we shouldn't be involved in power structures whatsoever, um, if indeed God and Jesus has a kingdom, and we are a part of that kingdom, um, then it feels right that we would play our part, that we would try to act lovingly, loving our uh, fellow citizens as not citizens but as brothers and sisters that we would try to reach out to the weakest and the most vulnerable that we would try to give them a hand up and that we would undergird them that we would make sure that they don't fall through the cracks of the world um, now this is not easy it's quite difficult and it demands that we're a people of prayer that we have the character necessary to exert any kind of power now, when we talk about power, oftentimes people, Presbyterians in particular, look at, well, if Jesus is a king, and if he does have power, what kind of power does he have, and where do we see it? And of course, the place that people would point to in Presbyterianism is in Jesus's power over the natural world, over things like disease and demons and miracle stories. This is where Jesus shows his power, but I actually think that that's not the case. I think that Jesus shows the power of the kingdom of God, shows the power of the kingdom of God in the Beatitudes when Jesus invites all of those who would listen and hear the truth of being the blessed, the poor, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who comfort. When Jesus bends down and begins to wash the feet of the disciples, that is where we see the power of of God, the kind of power that God's kingdom or kingdom has in service, in breaking bread with those who are on the margins, with inviting them in, in redrawing the circles of who matters and who counts and who is seen. This is the power of the kingdom. This is the power that is so dangerous to the powers of the world because it can't simply be fought off. It can't be snuffed out. It can't be jailed or executed away, right? It's not um, a political party that can be defeated in an election. It's evasive of the powers and the principalities. It flourishes in places where it cannot um, be stopped and in ways that are subversive because the kingdom of God is a subversive kingdom, right? It, it extends to um, people that you wouldn't ordinarily call your brothers and sisters. It draws together people across all dividing lines of the world. And so as we move forward into this new red alert system um, and this traffic light system, and we begin to see that we have more freedoms, might we enjoy them in a way that also never forgets those who are vulnerable, 
those who perhaps are even unvaccinated, who sees ourselves as intimately connected with them, and that their lot is our lot, that our success is their success, that their success is our success. Because the truth is, is that we need power in the world. We need people in charge to secure things like public health. But then we also need a group of people who ensure that those in power never forget about those who don't have any at all. So may you be blessed in the small ways that you exercise your place in God's kingdom. Amen. Let us pray for others. Our Father and our God, Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the opportunity to present our petitions on behalf of others to you. In coming to you, we are confident that you hear and understand us because you've gone through the same pain and suffering that your children experience. We pray for those in this country and across the world for whom the ongoing pandemic and the uncertainty of the times have brought about or compounded suffering. Those that have lost jobs, homes, and livelihoods. Those whose marriages, unions, and families have been weakened or torn apart by the strain. Those that are separated from their families and support systems. Those for whom increased frustration and fewer resources have meant more violence and victimization within their homes. Those that feel forgotten by systems and governments and are without hope. We pray, Lord, that if you don't save them from these circumstances, that you at least walk alongside these children of yours so that they know that they're not going through this alone. 
We pray for those in the front line of health care and service provision for whom an easing of restrictions is translating to overwhelming workloads and the risk of physical and mental exhaustion. We pray that you shall renew their energies and sustain their well-being. We pray for the children that have gone back to school and for their teachers and for their parents and caregivers. For some, the relief of getting back into a routine and reuniting with their friends is tempered by real fear about the risk of catching COVID and taking it home to their vulnerable family members. Lord, we pray for your protection upon them and upon their loved ones. We pray for those in this country and overseas, whether vaccinated or not, for whom COVID is turning out to be a death sentence. We know that whether or not they had underlying conditions is secondary to the fact that they have died of COVID during this pandemic. It does not lessen the grief that their families feel. We pray that you shall comfort their loved ones. We pray that there shall be places of love and protection for children that have been left without parents and for spouses that have been left without partners. We pray for those that are sick and that are dying with conditions other than COVID, whose diagnosis and treatments have been delayed because of the pandemic. We pray that you shall give governments and health providers wisdom in juggling the many groups of people that need care at this time. We pray for those experiencing environmental catastrophes like fires, floods, heat waves, and droughts. Those that are living and dying in areas torn apart by conflict those that have been displaced by strife and unbearable social, physical, and economic conditions and have no place to go. They can't go back to their homes and other countries are closed to them. We also pray for those that are in prison, whether justly or unjustly. Lord, may you bring comfort, love, and sustenance to these people in their time of need. Lord, we also pray that you shall remind us, those of us that have the privilege of not having to deal with the things that we have mentioned here and the many others that we haven't prayed about, that you shall remind us again and again how we might be your hands and your feet, how we might be agents of love and care to our neighbors both near and far. Lord, that you shall remind us of the responsibility that you have given us to take better care of the, nat the natural resources in our care, resources that we need to share across the world. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us pray together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
That's going to be our service for this Sunday. Thanks for being here with us, and we hope to see each other at summerville.chat just across the way on Zoom, and so we're hoping to connect with each other there. Keep in mind, we'll have some more information coming out this week about our reopening plan and when we'll see each other, and by the time we do, it'll be Advent and only a few weeks to Christmas, hopefully. That's what we're expecting. But um, until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you and with all of us now and forever. Amen.